Hello and thanks for joining me. It's the middle of winter here in the UK and it is bitterly cold today and uh, uh, it's it's just round about freezing actually and so I'm I'm not ashamed to admit that I've got my electrically heated jacket on today and uh, really enjoying that warmth but unfortunately because it's so cold they've been salting the roads like mad here and as you can see now it's it's actually just above freezing so the roads are wet and and just the salt is spraying up everywhere salt on everything so I'm really struggling to keep it off the um, off the camera lens so uh, my apologies if um, your view of where I'm going starts to get a bit hazy it's just impossible to avoid all of this salt anyway I've I've just been reading Guy Martin's book called when you're dead you're dead and um, it's a great read and I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested in Guy Martin's outlook on life and um, I see that he's recently released uh, another book entitled Dead Men Tell No Tales and I'll definitely be adding that to my um, very long to read list and what I find interesting is the choice of book titles by Guy Martin um, as both titles are obviously carefully chosen to reflect the death-defying activities that, that Martin gets up to and, you know, the, the, the accusation that some have thrown at him that he's, he's got a death wish. And this has made me reflect on and the fact that Guy Martin stands out these days in, in a world that has become obsessed with safety I think uh, and so I have a theory of course that's what I'm going to share with you um, if you hang on just negotiate this junction it's uh, it's quite quiet today but you know these these are busier roads than the ones I normally ride anyway I have a I have a theory if you live in a developed Western nation, which you're very likely to do if you're watching this video, then you live in one of the safest environments. You don't need to look back very far in history to see the, the real risks of death by violence, disease or, or natural disaster that our ancestors faced. Just for example, contrast the loss of life caused by the 1918 to 1920 Spanish flu pandemic. Compare that with the relatively small loss of life caused by the current ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, um, you know, it's terrible times we're living in, but the number of people who have died is very, very small compared to these pandemics in the past. And in fact, I was looking at some statistics recently and in 1921, that's just a hundred years ago, the average life expectancy was 51, 51 average. Um, and that's within the lifetime of my own grandparents. Today, the life expectancy in the UK is 81 years. So to put it simply, we live in very safe times in which we face very few real dangers in life. And so turning to motorcycling, you know, that's become safer than it used to be as well. These days we ride bikes with much better brakes and suspension, cornering ABS, traction control, better lighting for riding in the dark and now of course we're seeing radar systems being introduced as well and linked into cruise control and braking systems and what have you. Um, tires are much better than they used to be even 20 years ago and whatever bike you ride there's a huge range of tires available to you. On top of that motorcycle clothing and safety equipment has improved massively certainly in the time I've been riding we now have a great range of clothing 
that's designed to offer much better protection in the event of a spill and clothing that is, is waterproof and breathable, electrically heated, which I'm wearing today, and ventilated of course if it's, it's hot, so you can stay comfortable in any riding conditions. And we also have navigation systems now that will tell you exactly where you are, anywhere in the world. And into these systems you can program your route using a vast array of information available. So a couple of years ago I planned a ride from Anchorage, to Alaska, uh, Anchorage in Alaska to San Francisco in California. And I did it all from the comfort of my settee at home. Uh, with a laptop. I planned all the routes and fuel stops using Google Maps and I planned and booked at hotels and other meal stops and what have you using TripAdvisor and Expedia. It, it was actually laughably easy. And so my point here, here is... Okay, sorry, just stop for a bit of navigation there. So anyway, the point I was making uh, was, was that motorcycle travelling is much easier and safer these days than it has been in the past. Uh, there's less risk and, and uncertainty and above all there's, there's less danger and I think that um, it's because of this that we have seen the rise of adventure motorcycling and the adventure motorcycle industry and I put adventure in quotation marks here because it's this notion adventure that I really want to examine now because it seems that the word adventure has to be inserted into uh, descriptions of these activities these days why well in my opinion um, it's just that any use any motorcycle trip used to be an adventure but these days for the reasons that I've just set out it seems that the adventure has to now be artificially reinserted into motorcycling. So what exactly is meant by adventure motorcycling then? When you start looking at it closely it's a very elusive concept and I can't help but thinking that the Emperor really is wearing no clothes. It's just empty words. So let's let's try and look at some of the potential definitions and see why they are problematic. So what is adventure motorcycling? Well, adventure motorcycling maybe is defined by where you stay in terms of the way you're travelling. So camping and staying in wide wild places because that's getting out into the wilds and having adventures. Um, and back in the 1980s I used to go motorcycle touring every summer with my friends and we always camped. It was an integral part of motorcycle touring that none of us even questioned um, and many still do camp and I, and I still believe it's the best way to travel. However it certainly doesn't define adventure motorcycling uh, as, as the activity that we see these days because most companies that offer guided or pre-arranged adventure tours ensure that the riders are staying in good quality accommodation at the end of each day's ride wherever they are in the world and no matter how remote and most people I know who go off on uh, self-organized trips also stay in hotels or hostels so that doesn't define adventure motorcycling so so Maybe it's to do with the way you travel. So maybe adventure motorcycling is defined by the way you travel in terms of being self-contained. Because a typical image of adventure motorcycling is a, a BMW GS or a Honda Africa Twin loaded down with tools and spares and of course a couple of extra tyres lashed on the back of the bike. But again, that doesn't work, does it? Because you look at these uh, companies that offer adventure motorcycle tours and they have support vehicles, they have spare bikes, you know, backup bikes, they have a mechanic on hand to help you and a, a medic on hand in case there's any accidents and so certainly that doesn't define adventure motorcycling. So let's try somewhere else. Maybe adventure motorcycling is defined by the types of road that you ride on. So, of course, the stereotypical image of adventure motorcycling is a big adventure bike on a dirt road, or preferably 
splashing through a water crossing. Um, and for many, getting off tarmac seems to define adventure riding. Um, you know, riding off tarmac. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that is the case. Um, you know, most adventures that I've had, of you know, the, what I regard as being a big adventure has been on tarmac. And most of the off tarmac riding that I do is right on my doorstep within literally just within a couple of dozen miles of my own home so for me that certainly doesn't define adventure motorcycling so maybe adventure motorcycling can be defined by the places you visit it's about visiting remote new places and, and exploring um, so that's a possibility, but the reality is that the whole world is explored and civilised these days. And, and, and a practical reality uh, of travelling on a motorcycle is that you've got a fuel range of maybe 200, 250 miles at the most. And so it's impossible to be further than that from the next fuel stop, never mind the next civilization. Um, and, and if it's about visiting places that are new to you as, as an individual, well, most people can do that without travelling more than a day or two from home. I certainly can. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in terms of you know, exploring, finding new places, I've done more of that in the UK than I, than, than I have of, uh, you know, worldwide. So that, for me, certainly is not a good way of defining adventure motorcycling. So let's have a look at another attempt. Maybe it's about the, the bike that you ride. Maybe adventure motorcycling is defined by the type of bike that you ride. Now, I think this is getting close to, as close as we're going to get maybe, to what adventure riding is. It's actually just about riding a certain type of bike. But even this definition is problematic as there is a very strong counter movement in adventure touring on apparently inappropriate bikes such as Honda Cubs or, or, or a Suzuki GSXR, you know, traveling around the world on a Suzuki GSXR. So, you know, we can't even define adventure motorcycling by the type of bike. So, I don't know, is, is adventure motorcycling just about having an adventure? About just going off and having an adventure? Well, if that's the case, I've had some of my biggest adventures less than 50 miles from my home. If we're talking about exploring new places that I've never been before and, and riding challenging routes off-road and carrying all my gear on the bike and camping out in the wild, well, I've actually done all of that within 50 miles of where I live and on, on several occasions. So, to conclude, what is adventure motorcycling? I think it's just the Emperor's new clothes. What do you think? Please, share your comments with me below. As always, I don't claim to have the answers. I am just uh, asking the questions. Thanks very much for tagging along with me. Please write safely and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.